Right, so there's your answer. Right now at about 20 Celsius, the pressure of this cartridge is around 60 bar. Next time we're going to depressurize the contents of this cartridge and we're going to see what happens. So you've got a little bit of homework. You've got the pressure enthalpy charts for carbon dioxide. If you don't, you can go and download the mini RefProp program. Go and predict what happens when I depressurize this cartridge from 60 bar and 20 Celsius down to atmospheric pressure. See you next time. So at this point, there's no prizes for reading the title of the video and guessing that this carbon dioxide is going to go cold. But there's two questions. Firstly, can we predict how cold it's going to get? And secondly, if it does go cold, why is it that we don't use it in our air conditioners and our refrigerators and our kitchens? Why is it that we use these exotic CFCs and things instead? This is the pressure enthalpy chart that we use to figure out what the pressure of the carbon dioxide inside a CO2 cartridge was. We were trying to roughly estimate it without using a pressure gauge or simply googling what it was. So what we did is we figured out what the density of the carbon dioxide was because we knew the mass of CO2 and we could figure out what the volume of the cartridge was by filling it with water and seeing how much it weighed. We then looked at the constant temperature lines, the isotherms for 20 and 30 degrees, and saw where these intersected with the constant density line. We then read off roughly using this logarithmic axis what the pressure is. So our starting point for depressurizing the CO2 cartridge will be somewhere on the yellow line and it will be between the 20 and 30 degrees because that's the ambient temperature when we depressurize. So if we're depressurizing, obviously by definition, that means the pressure is dropping, which means we need to go down on the Y axis. That's where we've plotted pressure. But which line do we follow to go down? To answer that question, we need to look at the definition of enthalpy. Remember the chart we're looking at is a pressure enthalpy chart. Enthalpy consists of two terms, the internal energy term and a pressure volume term. A basic way of changing something's enthalpy is heating or cooling it. Another way of changing something's enthalpy is by making it do work or putting work into it. That's why we've got this PV term. To make a fluid do work, we run it across a turbine. To put work into a fluid, we run it through a compressor. When we pierce our cartridge, we are definitely not running any of the CO2 through a turbine. So the CO2 will not be doing any work. So we ignore the PV term, nor will we be heating or cooling it. This part is important. Saying that we will not heat or cool something is not the same as saying its temperature won't change. Heating or cooling means that we will take another source that is at a higher or lower temperature and then allow heat to be transferred between the two bodies. That means the enthalpy of the carbon dioxide will not change when we pierce the cartridge. This is known as an isenthalpic or constant enthalpy process and it is also referred to as a throttling process or Joule-Thomson expansion. Another example of this kind of process is when, say, steam passes through a control valve. That is how we would use the word throttling normally, right? We would say that we would tighten, close a valve and m give a bit of restriction to flow. There the steam is undergoing Joule-Thomson expansion. So a line of constant enthalpy on a chart that has enthalpy on its x-axis is a vertical line. If the cartridge starts at 20 degrees Celsius, the vertical line is here. On the other hand, if the cartridge is at 30 degrees Celsius, the vertical line will be here. Both lines go all the way down to atmospheric pressure or roughly one bar. 
As we go vertically down, we cross more and more of these horizontal lines, each of which represents a successive lower temperature. So we are cooling down. As we proceed further down, we're going further and further into the two-phase region, which means our liquid is turning into a vapor. In case you don't remember, if I'm sitting on the yellow cross in the two-phase region, it means that all the liquid in my mixture is sitting at point A, while all the vapor sits at point B. The closer the X is to point A, the more is in the liquid phase. The closer it is to point B, the more I have in the vapor phase. I always think of it as there is no molecule that exists inside this two-phase region. It's only the mixture that is there as an average. So once again, as I depressurize, I get colder and I convert more liquid into vapor. Now you may stop and say, all right, you've shown this error a thousand times, but you never go down all the way to atmospheric pressure to that one bar. And at this point, you are wondering, what is this conspicuous blank region in the bottom? Since the isotherms stop and are not shown on this plot, we cannot assume anything about the behavior of carbon dioxide at these pressures. There is no data, so we're just going to have to do the experiment and see what happens. I take my 16 gram carbon dioxide cartridge, which is sealed at the end here. This is the adapter I use. I screw in the cartridge into the adapter and it gets pierced by the bottom bit. And that's how I attach it to the valve on my bicycle tube. Very crudely, I insulate the cartridge because remember, if I allow heat transfer to take place, then this process is no longer isenthalpic. So the insulation is going to help me keep it as close as possible to the ideal Joule Thompson expansion. I take my two thermocouples, one of them simply reads ambient temperature, which is 28 degrees at the moment, and the other one I stick into the outlet of the adapter, so I'm measuring the carbon dioxide temperature as it's coming out after it's expanded. As always, safety first, so I don my safety gloves for this experiment. And what you would normally do to release the mechanism to allow the CO2 to escape into your tube would be to press it up against the valve, which we can't do here, so I'm going to be using a fork to press onto the end. You're going to want to watch the bottom temperature to check the temperature of the CO2. Well, that was quick. In case you missed it, there's a negative sign in front of that number, meaning the carbon dioxide dropped down to minus 72 degrees. If we go back to our pressure enthalpy chart, we can see that the last number we had, the last isotherm that appeared on this chart was at minus 50 degrees, which means we could have reasonably expected the temperature to go lower. But that minus 50 degrees was what we achieved already when we depressurized to seven bar. What happened from seven bar down to one bar in this mysterious region where we have no data? You may have noticed that there was nothing at first, but once the pressure got low enough, you could see that there were small white particles that began to fly around the place. These particles hung around for a little bit and then disappeared. If we inspect the nozzle, we can see we have quite a big chunk sitting at the outlet. This solid white stuff is solid carbon dioxide, also known as dry ice. The reason it is disappearing is because the solid phase is transitioning to the vapor phase directly without ever going through a liquid phase. This is known as sublimation. This is also the reason why we are missing all of this data at the bottom of our pressure enthalpy chart. This program does not provide any data for solid vapor equilibria. This is also why we couldn't really predict what the end temperature would be. A quick stopover at the Wikipedia page for carbon dioxide shows us the phase diagram for carbon dioxide. 
Notice how the liquid phase can only exist above a pressure that corresponds to the triple point of carbon dioxide. The triple point is the point at which all three phases can exist. But as soon as you drop below that triple point, which for carbon dioxide is 5.1 bar, the liquid phase disappears altogether. That is why we have no data for carbon dioxide below 5 bar. And that is also your first reason why you would not want to use carbon dioxide as a refrigerant in your own house. Now, let's make it very clear. Carbon dioxide is a refrigerant. It has its own R number like most refrigerants do. And it is used in, dust, in industrial applications as a refrigerant. The trouble is that you have to maintain higher pressures. If ever the pressure in your system drops below the triple point pressure and the system is cold, you will form solid carbon dioxide. That's a pain in the ass to remove. Okay, so let's pretend someone convinced us that putting carbon dioxide in our fridge or our air conditioner in our car is a good idea. To start, let's clear these lines which were specific to my CO2 cartridge and see what it would look like if it was in a fridge. I'm going to start with a base temperature of 20 degrees Celsius shown here and we're going to cool the carbon dioxide down to minus 20 degrees Celsius. We'll talk about the significance of these numbers in a second, but if we're doing this in a refrigerator or an air conditioner, our starting point is on the saturated liquid line and we use Joule-Thomson expansion to depressurize to minus 20 degrees. If we read off the pressures, that means this action requires us to depressurize from 58 bar down to 19 bar. Now let's do the same exercise again for R134A or the actual refrigerant that's sitting in your air conditioner and fridge. It's no, also known as Freon or tetrafluoroethane. Just like we did for carbon dioxide, we're going to go from positive 20 Celsius to negative 20 Celsius. The pressures required for this Joule-Thomson expansion are a start pressure of 5.7 bar and an end pressure of 1.3. I got the decimals from the vapor pressure of Freon from another source. I didn't read it off the side of the chart. You may not know this, but we're actually more than halfway to drawing a complete refrigeration cycle. There's some awesome videos explaining this, but I thought it may make sense to use a minute to go through it. If I remove some of the noise from this chart, we can see that the vertical blue line, the Joule-Thomson expansion we've been looking at, is the magic part that makes everything cold. The dark blue horizontal line is the part where we are heating up the refrigerant and thus cooling down air, which in turn we blow onto our hot sweaty faces. This is known as the evaporator because the refrigerant is turning into a vapor as we heat the refrigerant up and cool ourselves or our fridge down. The red horizontal line is a condenser. It is where we are taking the vapor phase refrigerant and turning it into a liquid under high pressure. We are limited, however, in how much we can cool down and condense by the ambient temperatures which we use to cool down. That is why this 20 degrees is way too optimistic because ambient temperatures in many places are a lot higher than this. You are more likely to only cool it down to around 40 degrees. This red line is the reason the back of your fridge feels so warm. Now all that we're missing is the link on the right hand side, which I have shown in yellow. This is your compressor. It compresses from 1.3 bar to 5.7 bar. The reason that the line is curved is because it lies on a line of constant entropy, as I've shown here. If you want to understand this further, I'd recommend you go and do a bit more research on this. I just wanted to give you the background and the context for where this expansion lies. Here I'm overlaying the carbon dioxide diagram we just looked at. You can see why the synthetic refrigerant we use is so incredible. The pressure range we work with in order to get the temperatures needed in fridges and aircon units is significantly lower. 
This has the benefits that the components that we use can be cheaper because they don't need to withstand these significantly higher pressures, which also come with safety risks. But the, also the power needed to compress the refrigerant to 6 bar instead of 60 bar is also less. This isn't to say R134A comes without any downsides. It is a hydrofluorocarbon, an HFC, which means that if it is released, it will act as a greenhouse gas as well as have harmful effects on the ozone in the upper atmosphere. To give some historical context as to why we use this chemical, HFCs were developed in the 90s to replace CFCs or chlorofluorocarbons because the chlorine containing variety had a much more harmful impact on the environment. The reason we used CFCs in the first place is because they were developed in the early 20th century as a safe alternative to ammonia as a refrigerant. Ammonia itself is explosive, while CFCs and HFCs are not under ambient conditions. So can we use carbon dioxide in our fridges and our air conditioners? Theoretically, yes. Practically and economically, not really. There are likely industrial applications where carbon dioxide is a good choice as a refrigerant, but I don't really know much about them. But if you were to try and do it in your home, it isn't just like you could bleed off the current gas and replace it with carbon dioxide. You'd need a compressor that could deliver much higher pressure, components that could withstand these higher pressures, you wouldn't likely cool it to below its critical point at 31 degrees and you'd also risk getting dry ice if you don't charge your system so that it was above 5.2 bar.